Hey, welcome to Tools on Tech. So I got the books device and one of the questions that a lot of people were asking is like, okay, what's the security like? And the security question mostly boils down to this thing comes from China. Is it sending stuff to the Chinese government? Um, which feels, you know, a bit paranoid, but as they say, it's not paranoid if they're really out to get you. And if you're an engineer like me, then the first question is, well, you know, I could just, you know, wiretap the device and see what it does. Now, I've watched other videos that I'll link below where people install apps on the device to monitor the traffic, which will work, but the app is, of course, like still at the whims of the device. So the device can tell it A, while it's doing B, because the app just has to believe whatever the device tells it. So to get to a more clean result, what I did is a new setup where I'm sending it through my laptop and I'm monitoring it from there. I will explain in detail. Now, for those people that are impatient and that just wanna know like, can I use my books device? Yes, you can use your books device. Like from what I've seen, from the traffic that I've went through, I don't see anything really weird. There's usually a lot of connections from any device. The rest of the video is mostly for the curious to see like what I did, how I tried to get to those results and maybe, you know, show you a few tricks on like why I now trust my device a bit more than I did before. Okay, so how am I testing this? Well, first of all, you have the books device and the books device itself, as you can see, it's connected to Eve and Eve is my laptop. So my laptop here is set up as a hotspot. And because it's a hotspot, that means that all traffic goes from my books through my laptop and then my laptop connects to the internet. Now there's a more complex setup here because I didn't have a cable here and I needed to fix that, but that's just me making it very complex for myself. The end result's the same thing. Laptops wired has a connection. The hotspot means that all the traffic goes through the laptop and because the laptop is a Linux machine that I control, I can run Wireshark on that and track all the packages that are in there and tell you what I find. Now, to give you a feel of what it is, I am going to start Wireshark on my system and then remote connect to my laptop so I can start tracking it. Uh, one of the reasons I'm doing that is mostly for recording purposes. After this, we will replay a log that I made on the laptop by having the books just lie somewhere still and run for half an hour and we'll really in depth analyze this. But this is mostly to show the process, to show like how am I monitoring this and what does that give me as a result? So how does that look in practice? Well, I have Wireshark open, I got this whole system set up and I'm using the SSH remote capture to log into my laptop and get the data so I can record it for you here. And let's just start this. And what I'll get then is basically all the traffic that's happening. And this is gonna be very much like the things that you see here are the SSH connection that got set up. It's doing some weird things left and right. It's showing packages. So this is a bit of a mess. The first thing that we're gonna do is we wanna filter out the books data. So the thing that I do is on the books, I go to the Wi-Fi and then there's an icon in the end and they'll give me the IP address and then I can filter on it. So I'm going to say IP source is 10.42.0.112. That is from the temporary network that I got set up with the hotspot and I hit enter. And at that point in time, the logging should be boring if it's good because the books isn't doing much. So we should see some data, but not a lot. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a recording on the books so you can look with me without me having to set up the whole extra camera setup and it will make it a bit more readable so you know wins all around so got the books open right now you already see some traffic coming in um and i'm gonna go go to notes for example if i then take my scratch pad notes and i'll add a quick line on that in the moment i do that and i go out of it it will start doing stuff and processing. Now, one of the things that I'm trying to show here is that as you can see, as soon as I do things on the la on, on the tablet, then a lot of this data pops by. And this is still not very useful because it shows every package or thing that it can find. So to make it a bit more visible, one of the things you can do is you can go to statistics and you can go to conversations. And that will tell me like, you know, which connections are happening there. Numbers though, don't tell me a lot. So I'm going to add the name resolutions and start time to it. And then I can see what it's actually commuting to. Things that I see here are, for example, Amazon, which is to be expected, for example, because I have Logseek running on it and it's storing things in the Amazon cloud. Uh, but I also see eurobooks.com, which is meant because I use sent to books and I use their web services. So it should be connecting to that to talk about it. I see 10.4201, but that's just my laptop. So we can ignore that one. Uh, we see a connection from outside towards 
the books device. I don't think that's a big issue. That is, if I look at the IP address, the one that I already had, we'll dive into that one a bit more detailed after this. I see my stack storage, which is normal. I got a cloud uh, sync running there. It has my own name in it, so, you know, should be good. <laughs> uh, then I see the Onyx cloud and that goes for the US. And finally, we have like a Knivity check G static. I think that's a Google, like, is it up? check and we see the Play Store. So nothing really weird happening here. But of course, this is just the system of the device. It's been up for a few seconds. As I start doing on my device, in the background, I'm now starting Todoist. Uh, I'm not recording that because I haven't got Todoist prepared for showing it to the world. But then you immediately see like, hey, Todoist.com shop shows up. So as soon as I start apps, I get what I expect from an Android device. It's connecting to apps. But the thing that you might want to know is like, okay, it's nice. You know, it's been running for five minutes. Will we'll tell me that. I have a log file for me monitoring this for like half an hour when it's idle. So it's just lying somewhere. If it's planning any nefarious stuff, then it will do it when you're not using the device and it's just lying there and, you know, phone home. So let's have a look at that pre-captured log file and then go through the lines one by one. Okay, so how does that work? How do you do a pre-recorded? So this recording here, I mean, it just tracks all the packages that come in, but you can also open things. So I, recent, I have this one and that is no usage 30 minutes. And these files are pretty large. I mean, we're talking megabytes. Let's see the no usage one has 40 megabytes and I had like a heavy usage one where I just did 50 minutes of actively using apps and stuff like that to see how it tracks. We're going to look at the interesting, what does the books device do if left to its own devices. So I'm going to continue without saving. I'm just going to load that file. Again, this is a lot of data. Yeah, I won't be making a lot of this because if I have to read for this, I'll go nuts. So go to conversations again, say name resolution again, and I'm just going to look at these conversations that are happening. And then we can just go top to bottom. What was happening when the device was just lying there being menacing on its own? Oh, well, the first one's easy. Uh, EuroCBbooks.com. That's their own cloud service pinging back to me. Uh, that's expected. I'm using the cloud service. Uh, I do like the fact that it's all within Europe, at least this connection. And then we have the browser intake Datadog HQ and we have the NTP from Datadog. That to me looks like analytics. Datadog is a monitoring tool. Uh, I have used it before. It's used to check if a server is up, if things are running. Uh, one of the main reasons why the device will be talking to it and not the server is because you might want to do like a time tracking thing. So by doing the time on the device, knowing the time on the server, you know what kind of latency is happening. This is for monitoring to see, for example, hey, is the network slow in between? Do we need to switch to a different data center because things are down? This is to be expected. And it's also not a lot of data. You see like a couple of kilobytes and a couple of bytes. So it's mostly checking. NTP, so that is checking if the, the time device is good. This is usually goes over multiple things. NTP comes back, the internet runs on time. People don't realize, but it happens. Eve.local is my laptop, so I don't care about that. I pretty much trust that one. Then we have feature flags for Todoist, which is because I have Todoist installed on this device and it checks which features should be enabled and which shouldn't be enabled. Uh, stack storage. So I use a WebDuff storage uh, called Stack from TransEPay and I store everything on it. One of the main things that I love with that is the fact that I have full control over it, that it's within the Netherlands, so I'm not sending my data overseas and that I can use WebDuff and WebDuff is nearly available on a lot of things. The books has it. Uh, I think it's absolutely amazing that anytime I update a note, it will save it as a PDF and upload it towards my Stack storage, meaning that if books, my device would fall into the water and and the books company would disappear tomorrow, I would still be able to access my notes, which gives me a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling inside. Another data dog one. Uh, then we see one with 1e100.net. For those that don't know, that is actually uh, a funny way of writing Google uh, and is used by Google. So this is talking to the Google services. If you don't trust, well, you don't trust Google, but uh, if you <laughs> don't want to put a lot of faith in Google, yeah, you shouldn't be getting an Android device. So, you know, that's that's to be expected. Firebase login, Google Appies. This is also Google. This is Google. This is Google. Uh, then we get to the annoying one, the Facebook one. I don't have any Facebook apps on this. I try to avoid it at all cost on the books device and still it's talking to Facebook. This is the um, dystopian future that we're in. So, you know, it's talking to uh, Facebook probably for some type of commercial or tracking. It's six kilos. Kilobytes, so it isn't a lot, but I'm still annoyed that it happens. Then and two other Google services. So Google mostly uses this for internal machines that they're talking to, another Google API, another Google for Play Anycast. So I think that's for the Play services to check for versions. Uh, then we get this one, the 216, 
2.239.3436. And I think I have that one on the list here. So let me show you. So what I did is I typed this into like an IP locator tool to get some information about that IP. And as you can see, Google is mentioned here. So this again is Google, but then just on IP basis and not on name basis. Very, very boring. I don't think looking at the books device that we should be worrying about the books phoning home i think we should be more worried about the amount of phoning home with google that it does then again the operating system is android so yeah it's kind of expected uh, and then finally endatabooks.com and that sends data so i think that just does like an english update thing but it also it doesn't send a lot of data it's like three kilobytes i mean that's if you make a a bit fanatic notes then that's like uh, already more so no real problem cases that i i see here i'm just having the thing lying down and, and running now there's a couple of limits here uh, this is also one of the reasons why i also did like netguard running on the system is that i don't know which data comes from which app and where it goes and that is something that the other video i'll, I'll link to it he did like a nice in-depth look at all the things running. One question that comes from that video is like, what does K-Sync do and why is it there? I can tell you what K-Sync does. K-Sync is used to generate those PDFs and put them on your own storage device. So yes, if you want your notes to be stored in PDF format on your own storage device or in Google Drive or Dropbox, I believe, then you want that K-Sync solution. The other problem that you have is by definition, the internet tries to be secure. That means that a lot of the connection are HTTPS, meaning you can't look inside the connection that is the whole point of it if i could look into the connection then not only i could do it but your isp could do it as well and that's a whole new can of worms so yes i can see the connections and i don't see any weird things happening with the connections but that doesn't tell you what's inside it so books could send like extra data inside the connection however the thing that you can't fake is the amount of data and then when i look at the amount of data sending up and down that actually doesn't look that bad like it's mostly updates checking if things are there things are in sync and those are at the size that I would expect them to a couple of kilobytes meaning like hey are my files still up to date yes your files are up to date excellent let's go on our days if I make an update I did a test where I changed the PDF then you see like a free megabyte file come by because you know I just uploaded a PDF to a stack exchange and that is to be expected and then it doesn't send as much data towards books, which I'm actually surprised about. So it seems that in the background, the PDF files are large, but whatever books uses as an internal format is just the pen strokes. And so that comes down to kilobytes again. So really clever system that they have got set up there i don't know what they're using but probably something like factor graphics finally another limit is time now if i wanted to do a full full test i would have to like i don't know put my books in a corner have it running for like 24 7 seven days a week to see what's happening like monitoring it all the time there's a couple of things that i'll hit one is that my laptop would be up and monitoring all that time i wouldn't be able to use it two there would be a tremendous amount of data to go through uh, the hotspot would fall a couple of times because you're going like why are you using the hotspot there's like three other wi-fi connections that you can use so it's very hard to do like a full week's tracking and i don't think we'll get more information from it because if it's doing weird stuff in the background then we should have been seeing that in the half an hour or in one of the many other tests that i did to set up this video so i did the half an hour log file that i show but also like a 15 minute heavy test i had the thing running for an hour i've been running it for another couple of hours while i was recording this video so you can always do better but looking at a in-depth glance i would say you know feel free to use your books device. It doesn't do any weird stuff. Uh, just keep in mind that if you're using any of their cloud sync options, they will go to European or US servers, depending on where you're at. Chinese servers, obviously, if you're near China. And, and you know that's the thing that you have to keep in mind. That said, a lot of my notes that I make are usually not too sensitive. That's one of the things that I try to do. The books for me is a device that very often goes to meetings where it's more the large scale things. Uh, and not the technical details uh, the same thing for when i went to like the da vinci resolve conference uh, i think last week where i make like a lot of notes and then i send them to chat gpt to convert them into logseq notes and those are you know publicly available 
presentation. So the notes that I'm making aren't really uh, things that I worry about security wise. As soon as it goes into LogSeq, however, that part I do care about the security. I was also tracking LogSeq with doing like the same system and there I get what I expected to see and that is that LogSeq mostly talks to the S3 storage bucket, which is what I know from how LogSeq sync works. That means that it does the sync locally, encrypts the files and sends them to an S3 bucket uh, and all the work is done basically by the bucket and not by some server in between that can read your file. Little tidbit of information for my LogSeq fan base that uh, might be looking all the way till the end. Well, I think that's about as much as I can talk about this. You know, Books Device looks good. Remember, you're awesome. Keep it up. See you in the next one.